Director David Fincher. The teaser for the the movie in, involved a, a marionette that was being sort of tortured, and I always thought that was a nice, clean indication of what the movie was about. But um, the marketing people at, at um, Polygram had come up with this crumbling face puzzle piece thing, and and I wanted to kind of integrate the the puzzle pieces somehow into the into the movie so that the two things were not completely disparate. Um, one of the things that was interesting about the, uh, about the script was uh, uh, Ferris and Brancato had this idea that you could set the movie up with these home movies and then the home movies would become the flashbacks. Production designer Jeffrey Beecroft. Scene one was exterior gardens and the mansion for the birthday party. Uh, it was a 1950, late 50s, early 60s party. Uh, Kennedy, uh, the Kennedy era Hyannisport overlaying a 30s feel, cigarettes, ladies with compacts and lighters, croquet on the lawn, football rounded on the edges, sailing ships and pond models, a beautiful puppet show. The dad is to look like Joseph Kennedy. I wanted to create this kind of safe world and then you know that it's destroyed when the father dies. Michael Douglas. Well, I wish I'd seen the uh, home movies before the picture started, too, because it would have really helped uh, a lot. Uh, and it kind of really set the tone of how, how destructive my character, Nicholas Van Orton, was. There was always the in the script, the, you know, them putting the, the baby brother in his arms. Um, and when we did it, the baby started crying, the baby that we'd cast. And I just thought, that just seems really real to me. And it seems like it has a, and it certainly has a place in our story. You know, it's like, you know, and, and also the, the kid, Scott, who, who played uh, the young Michael, was, he, had this, he has these kind of wonderful sort of circles under his eyes. And he, he is sort of a Charles Adams, like, <laughs> child without, you know, with it, without it being so overt. Well, the first scenes uh, are always difficult because you feel a responsibility of setting up. That, um, that splashing the water on your face and that moment of just having to stare almost right at the camera. Uh, I'm somebody who's generally camera shy. I'm gun shy. It's hard for me to, to look down the barrel of it. It's, it's been taken um, uh, a, a while. But uh, again, all of this really was so choreographed by David uh, so strongly, and I think he was looking for this um, metronome, clock, unemotional, routine, uh, dead, basically, you know, brain dead, uh, or at least in terms of uh, a soul or a heart and the repetition, and um, and and creating this uh, very quickly and briefly this this ambiance this this whole world that he lived in between his house his office in San Francisco the car he drove the valet picking him up uh, opening the door for him going to his office well tell me what we're supposed to do I mean you may be perched Jeffrey Beecroft what I do is basically um, like you you develop a point of view for this for the uh, film uh, in other words, a concept or a sentence, try to put it in one sentence. Basically, this is about a man who loses control. Uh, and, and, how, and then it becomes, how do you implement that? And we had to put him off balance. So what you do is you slowly take away everything he knows. And you, then you have to rebuild him again. So that at his deepest, deepest darkest point, it's, he's buried. So when he's going to the office, as he's going down the hill, he's descending. He's descending into another world from his lofty heights. This picture followed uh, a lot of things in my own personal life. I was in the middle of going through a, a divorce myself when this picture was going, when the game was going on. And it was a time for, uh, for me to use a lot of, a lot of myself uh, in the picture. And I think you just have to decide 
in the films how much and where that's going to happen. Uh, so I'm, I'm, it's nice to hear the sense of it's taken me a long time to believe that I had enough uh, charisma, or whatever it might be, screen presence that I had to do something. It's taken a long time to simplify and be able to trust yourself and not believe that you had to do more. And David was very helpful in that area on this picture, and, and so was the script. And then an opportunity to work with actors like Sean Penn. It's a small part, uh, but he's a wonderful actor. He's a great listener, uh, and is an inherent, you know, has inherently just a great talent. I had always seen Conrad as being this, as the guy who has seen the light. He's totally reborn. He is as open and as friendly and as, and you can't kind of understand why his brother is so, why Nicholas is so distant with him and so cautious of him. But I realized that Sean Penn is not, no matter how open and true and whatever conduit you're going to see to the, you know, to the great white light, you know, you're, you're always going to, you're always, you, you're not going to turn your back on him. I mean, Sean's just that kind of guy. He just brings this other, there's another current there that's going on that you have to, and it was interesting because when they both came in, they, when they were rehearsing, you went, Sean knows that he can't present himself that way. And as much as he tries, he knows that it's a performance and he knows that it's an effort. He understands that. And and so he tries where he can and where he can't. He He's happy to, to lay off. You know what I mean? He's happy to kind of go, hey, well. A major break that came in one of the drafts we did not work on um, was making the Sean Penn character uh, a younger brother instead of a best friend from, like, prep school days. Uh, we had always approached it from the best friend angle because we just sort of had this preconceived notion that uh, that Nicholas should be an only child and uh, have grown up in that kind of isolation. Um, once we had the connection of a younger brother in place, suddenly the jump became a lot easier to swallow, I think, uh, because there's all that bond. Uh, there's just so much emotional bonding and stuff that people understand goes on between brothers, even really antagonistic ones like this that suddenly you can accept his doing this thing, making this decision, just to appease his brother, just to, uh, just to work off some baggage from childhood. As soon as the idea uh, was broached to us, why not make the David character, because he was named David in the first draft, his brother, I think instantly we said, hey, yeah, you know, that really works. Why didn't we think of that? That's a really clean, workable idea. I think it was David Fincher's idea originally. And... In that case, it was very easy to let go. As soon as we heard it, we, we realized how it would just create a domino effect through the story and really help strengthen the character relationships. And the brother addition was probably the major uh, element that came late in the development process to, to push the story over. Because I think the emotional chilliness of it was always another problem that people had with the script. It was much too heady and insufficiently hearty. I guess, in, in dealing with emotional issues. And the brother helped give us a much more visceral, emotional core to the story. A lot comes out between Penn and, and Douglas in the film that I think is really nicely handled by the actors and the director that wasn't in the first draft, that there wasn't that element to it. We were working with a very different relationship between the lure into the game and the player. Happy birthday, Mr. Van Morrison. Happy birthday. Here's the tricky thing. Um, you're making a movie, and the audience knows you have control over everything that somebody sees and hears for two hours, every single thing. And the audience knows that you can show them anything. I mean, they know that you've got computers and you can make transverse Rex eat a car. So. They know you can do anything. So the question is, what don't you do? Not what do you do. Um, every time you go to a close-up, the audience knows subconsciously that you've made an editorial decision, that you said, look at this, this is important. Well, in a movie like this where everybody's lying, 
you can run an audience ragged by showing them things that are supposedly important because everything that's a close up is important, whether it's important or not. When you cut to a close up of somebody's face, it's, you're going in for a reason. You're doing it for a reason. There's no choice in the matter. I mean, it's not a, it's not like you can say, oh yeah, well no, I meant to do it on this one, but this one. It's like, well, you can do it as a red herring, or you can do it, you know, you can do it before you really want to to set up what it is that you really want to do or you can do it afterwards and you can but every time you underline something and, and a close-up is an underlining of something every time you do that the audience becomes aware of it and they start to catalog those things because they know that this movie is going to have suspense and mystery in it and they're starting and you don't want to exhaust that so one of the and you and you know that you're you're getting to by page sixty you're getting to a moment where you're gonna go all of that stuff was bullshit, so you have to be very very cautious and careful about when you choose to do it. My tact on it was I wanted to present in as wide a frame and in as as uh, unloaded a situation point of view as possible as much of a kind of just simple proscenium way this is what's going on this is what this guy sees you know and 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 to experience the movie through michael douglas and and you know and you have to be so ca cautious of doing too much cinematic engineering i didn't want to cut the movie's cut a little bit more um than i wanted it to certainly in scenes where, with deborah deborah you know, she had a lot of very complicated things to do in terms of the wine spilling and, you know, and, and we had to, like, take Michael's shirt off him between takes and re get him a new suit, you know, every time, that kind of stuff. So that scene's cut a lot more than I wanted to. I wanted it to play in a moving master as much as possible until the she gets reprimanded by the Mater D. But um, we ended up having to shoot coverage. And um, but the idea, the style of the movie was to do something that was much more open and much simpler, so that you kind of go, you know, the the director's job is to cast these actors, give them the lies to come in and say, and have them come in and say them as convincingly as possible, and not to, you know, when you cut to somebody's face, the audience knows that you've taken some time out you've you've done something you've lost something you've gone to something that excises other aspects of the room to showcase this one thing um there's a there's something behind it there's a reason whatever the reason is if it's not clear at the moment it'll be made clear later so it puts this importance on it you have to be very careful about how much importance you put on anything because everything is going to add up everything is the audience is cataloging it all so um it's a tricky movie in that respect, and, and you know maybe I'm overthinking it, but I I always felt like, you know what, what you really want to do is, is uh, get out of the way of the material and not do too many kind of telling, you know, kind of push in on on the, the keys or too many telling kinds of uh, close-ups of things. Screenwriter John Brancato. The movie is a one joke movie, really, that there is this game and it's supposed to change your life and it will have a happy ending. They pretty much tell him from the beginning what it is he's going to get. It'll be an entertainment, it'll be a distraction. But the way entertainment works is that you have to forget that you're being entertained. That that's a lot of what we then set out to do to the audience member. And a lot of it depends on the audience's basic suspicion of anything that's presented to them by like a corporate face like that, that they sort of suspect, oh, this isn't really what they're up to, that we're working toward the basic idea that, oh, it's a con game, that that's, of course, what it's always been about, and that we sell that, or we attempt to sell that pretty convincingly, figuring that's what the audience is expecting anyway. And, you know, I guess that's the main flip in, in the perspective of it. Jeffrey Beecroft. Basically, CRS, I wanted to begin to begin the game and for him to go down through a maze. And so I used a lot of horizontal lines here and I brought the ceilings down. And an interesting thing that we did is we top lit all of the scenery. So as you can see, it's a soft ceiling and Harris lit from above. And it almost is, as David called, his skull was floating through the environment. And um, you can see that. Uh, Michael can take light in any direction and 
we used a lot of top light here and we could float Michael through. And as you, when you're looking at this, you're looking down the hallways, the lines are always pointing in a direction. Like, which way are you going to go? At the beginning of the Yellow Brick Road, where Glenda sees Dorothy, there's a, there's a circular, um, almost like a snail shape. And what I did is I based the floor plan of this set on that shape. I, it's just a fun thing to put into a game. And, uh, and that shot, uh, David was going to take Michael all the way down the hall and wrap him around, and we cut out of that before we didn't, we didn't do that. Production design is a key element to CRS because one of the things that you have to do with CRS in a very short amount of time is present the idea that they know more than you. One of the things Jeff and I talked about over and over and over again was you wanted, in CRS, you didn't want it to seem secretive. It wants to seem open and you want to see all these things going on and you want to see that there's computers involved in this in this endeavor and, and high technology involved in it and CAT scans and it's medical and it's, you know, these guys have, they've figured it out. These guys have done their homework and they, they know more than you, you know. Um, ask Mr. Science, you know. <laughs> There's also an aspect of, of the confidence game. Oh, it's a game. A game. Specifically tailored for each participant. Think of it as a great vacation. Yeah, except you don't go to it. It comes to you. Is even though the background is telling you they're capable of anything, right? They've got all these SGIs and and they've got all you know these phone systems and they got a medical examination thing and they've got MRI and they've got all this cool stuff and they have this weird screening room where they show you these things and who knows what how it all works together. It's bigger than you can possibly imagine, but. The face of the company is this guy who's eating his Chinese food and he doesn't know where he's put that thing and, oh, you don't have to worry about that. And, and you get this feeling like you're smarter than him or you're more organized than him. So as bad as it could get, it's still, this is kind of a schlubby guy. He doesn't really have, he's not, if he came across as James Mason from North by Northwest, you'd be like, whoa, I don't want to get involved in this. But he's, it's not... It's like he's, he pulls the rug out from under himself. He can't kind of like, he can't sort of juggle all the things that he has to juggle. He's still kind of like lost in, the, in, in how it all works. And, um, and that's the only way you can have somebody present this idea that I can't tell you what it is just yet. It'll be great. It's personalized for you. The only way you can, if, if somebody like, you know, you know, if, if some smoothie did that to you, some guy who's really slick, you'd be instantly on your heels because you'd see the capability. You see through the walls, the glass walls all around him, you see that these guys have, they got an enormous financial backing for whatever it is that they're doing. They've got the ability to do anything. And now, and now who, and why would you want to sign up for that if you don't know what it is? And if the guy seems like he's really smart and really sharp and really, and, and, you know, of course we have this instantaneous distrust for, um, anybody who seems brilliant this day and age. Um, he, he, you know, he, the face of CRS is still this kind of friendly, you know, he needs to feel powerful in this, you know, he needs to feel like he's, like he's, worthy of being impressed you know that they're trying to sort of impress him and and you know or or not that they're trying to impress him but that the thing is impressive to somebody who is impressive he can't figure it out and and you're still sort of looking up at him like mount rushmore you know he's he's still uh, i don't know i don't know i i cancellation ship back to wednesday tomorrow yes how much longer is this going to take shouldn't be long you're almost done you said that two hours ago. All right, put it back until tomorrow. This is just the only place we could put the camera where we didn't get the projector down the lens, so. I just like the idea of being left in a, in a theater. You know, it's like, I mean, there's like, it's like, and again, it cuts down to like, you're not done till the movie's done with you kind of thing. And like, you're sitting there and you have this weird test and you don't know how the test works and yet, and it also seems like the people who are running the test are off getting a coffee or something, and, and you're kind of asking these questions and nobody can answer them for you. It's just this sort of idea of, like, who's who's minding the store? I'm sorry to keep you waiting. 
director of photography, Harris Savidis. The lighting on this particular project, the, the lighting, came, the, the decision to have a, the quality of the certain kind of lighting came before we knew that what the sets were and where we were going to be shooting. We wanted it to look like um, it was very natural. Like it was like this is the way an office would look or this is the way a home would look. That was a, it was a goal to really kind of hold back. And it's actually a very simple approach to uh, filmmaking. But in its simplicity, um, I think it gives the film a certain kind of elegance um, uh, in, in, in us holding back and holding back consistently, it gives the film a certain kind of elegance or, or regalness, which, which befits the story and the character and the world. You want to do dinner? Okay. By the way, I went to CRS. Really? What'd you think? Well, they seemed just a little bit disorganized. Well, when I did it in London, they'd been around a while. Are you going to do this? No, I haven't decided yet. I'm very proud of this scene at the uh, at the club, the gentlemen's club. I love the locker room setup. The windows have uh, thousand H on them, which is a tracing paper that we use a lot in, in filmmaking. There's no fill light except for one light over Michael Douglas, uh, and I think it's a Kino flow there, and uh, it's just top lighting him. And that's it. This scene in the gentlemen's club is one of my favorite scenes in the movie. And this scene is lit with practicals, uh, the muzzball, and covered wagons. When we would do coverage on an actor, that muzzball would favor that particular actor. And when you work in a circular, in a kind of circular kind of scene like this, where they're kind of all sitting around a table, it's a, a really good application for something like a muzzball. And the fall off is wonderful. And in this kind of moody gentleman's club, it, it was a good way to go. You did. It's very fast, and so, actors love it because they are uh, no, not, not sitting there waiting for us. They're, they could stay in the moment. One of the worst uh, frustrations for an actor no is to be called to the set after no matter how long the waiting had been for lighting and not to have your time. And as you get there, there's one last tweaking of lights that has to be done. or that. And it's a real ego thing I've, I've learned now, and I, I, I used to be more forgiving about it. Now I'm not. I, don't, I resent it, which is that, you know, everybody needs their time. And, you know, you as a cameraman, you can have as long as you want. It was the one thing I asked to David before we started. I said, whatever it needs, needs. But when I come in there and when you call me, I'll be right there. Then it's our time. And he was great that way. He was, and, and Harris was great. And you'd arrive, and then that was your time. You could do your couple rehearsals, you could shoot, but it was for you. And too many times you'd do pictures where either because they're rushing, the cameraman's, all right, call them in, call them in. And then their idea is, okay, well, I'll just overlap as the actors come in. I'll overlap doing my tweaking of the lighting and this and that. And it's very disconcerting because it doesn't allow the actor to take stage. And an actor needs, even before the cameras roll, to take stage. They need that moment to center themselves and to be the center of attention. They need that energy. And if you have people doing two or three things at the same time, it's disconcerting. This is one of the things, again, about David, that he has great respect for actors. A lot of directors can't help themselves. They have this love-hate relationship with actors. They, they know they need them, yet they resent the fact of how much they get paid, of how much, how much attention that they get and take. And, uh, you know, and so they dissipate. They end up, you know, they can't help themselves but sort of dissipating an actor's energy as a cameraman does. And that didn't happen on the game. I was very grateful to Harris CBD and to David Fincher. I think you have to take into consideration the fact that you're working with um, these actors and that you have to be uh, very prepared when they come on to set because they're about to start doing this amazing, uh, wonderful thing that they do. And it's hard. And it's just, depending on the scene, it's very hard. And you, I don't want to get in their way. I don't want to stop them. I don't want to interrupt them. I don't want to uh, interfere with that flow. The house is in, in uh, Stanford, and the gates were done at the um, Presidio. 
in San Francisco. So they were shot weeks and months apart. To pick up the shot, we had to do an available light. And the last takes of the day where the, where the light was darker than it was, so you could still have some kind of exposure on the ground, um, just were too grainy, were printed too dark, and didn't kind of cut. Screenwriters John Brancato and Michael Ferris. Michael Ferris. Part of what happened in the original version was that uh, the Van Orton character is learning more about his father and why his father killed himself. He's deluded himself into thinking that his father was going through some terrible financial crisis and was being crushed under the weight of his own debt and therefore took his life because he was a coward and, and wanted to get out. And CRS teaches him that his father, in fact, wasn't undergoing any such crisis, that he was just a profoundly depressed and, uh, and disturbed man. Our original conception was to make it a much younger character, somebody between the ages of 20 and 30 with inherited wealth, somebody who'd be a lot more liable to enjoy the game and take time off to play it and, and be into the adventure and the discovery of it. We always thought that if you have a character who's pushing 50, it starts to be pure sadism. Uh, with an older character, it's more like he's coming to grips with his own mortality. And I think that was the, the sensible direction they had to move in once they were, they were casting somebody of Douglas's age. Um, and it also probably does make sense that they got rid of a lot of the, the, the jokes and the, the lighter touches because uh, they wouldn't have been as appropriate. Director David Fincher. This may have been a mistake, this showing the CRS on the key at that moment. It might have been better just to show a key and, and not... Uh, but I kind of liked, I just liked how, I liked how much CRS kind of got their logo around. You know, I love the fact that they, they were kind of the, uh, they're like the, the Warner Brothers studio store. You know, like everything that they, <laughs> they did, they somehow have to like take credit for it. A recent poll suggests a staggering 57% of American workers believe... There's a funny story about Daniel Shore. Um, in the original script, it was Bernard Shaw from CNN. It was Bernard Shaw that would be computer-generated and, and talk to him. And I love that idea, you know, I, because Bernard Shaw is, has, is a sort of... He's kind of a weird generic celebrity in a weird way. There's something singular and specific about him and his look. And so we contacted CNN about, and they said, absolutely not. None of our hard news anchors can, will, we don't allow them to do it. And we were like, really? And they said, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it, would, it can't happen. It will never happen. Don't even worry about it. Since then, I think Bernard Shaw has probably been in more fucking movies. I mean, I think he's in Murder at 1600 and The Lost World. And I mean, you can't like swing a dead cat without hitting a Bernard Shaw movie. You know, it's like he's he's in everything. He's like he's working harder than, you know, <laughs> he's he's in more movies than Kevin Spacey. Anyway, they said no. And, and we went out looking and, and um, you know, I, was, I guess I was listening to NPR and, and Daniel Shore has that kind of great David Brinkley kind of old school of journalism you know, he's got this kind of interesting fire to him. And so we contacted him, and, and as it would happen, he had done a part in the net, a Ferris and Brancato script that was, I don't know if I'm talking out of school here, but, but, but Ferris and Brancato had written the game, and a producer had gone, come to them and said, we want you to write a movie for us like the game. So they wrote The Net. And The Net was made years before the game was made. And as it turned out, Daniel Shore was in it and had not had a particularly good experience on it. Didn't, you kind of thought the whole thing was weird and you waited around too long and had to do, you know, I mean, he was, he, so he was a little bit crotchety about the whole thing. And we assured him that he wouldn't have that kind of experience on this and I had told the um, the casting agent you know this is what I'm gonna want he has to read he's got like four or five pages of dialogue and this is and it's a performance you know and 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 a, somehow this did not get through Daniel Shore's agent so Daniel Shore just thought he was gonna come and read some bogus copy that would be and he didn't know that he had to interact with Michael Douglas and he didn't know that we'd have to videotape it first and then morph it all together and and put these backgrounds and shoot a green screen and do this whole thing and and uh, and he happened to show up in LA we had him for one day on a Sunday and we flew him in and and he happened to arrive the day that a New York Times article about journalists selling out and doing movies 
came out and one of the people prominently displayed was Daniel Shore, you know, still from the net. And the day, and, and like, you know, one of our PAs, you know, <laughs> they got him out of a town car and he went into makeup and this, one of our PAs walked up to him and said, hey, you're in the paper and handed it to him. And so he was kind of freaked out. I mean, he was like a little bit like, oh, should I be doing this? And then we go up to him and hand him five pages of dialogue and I start explaining the scene to him and he's like wait I had no idea that I, I just thought I was going to come and read some bogus newscast and what is all this you know I, I mean I'm responding to something that he says to me and because it was all shot in advance and, and he was just freaked well this is the, this is the whole thing about the experiences for, for Nicholas is that he's He's become, he has a heightened awareness of, uh, and now, of course, we're going to just be, we're just throwing him red herring after red herring. It's people using sign language and, you know, a guy on the phone dressed like a, you know, a, a pilot who doesn't look like a pilot and, and, you know, more guys with keys and, you know, like what, you know, there's a very, there's a actually an incredibly childish aspect of the movie which is i'm I, I think everybody there's a moment in or a time a period in everybody's life when you're five or six or seven years old when you start to wonder about whether or not everything that you're seeing around you is being done for your benefit you know in some way and and there's there there is that i mean maybe it's maybe, maybe it's just me it's my own uh my own narcissism but but uh, i i think that it's i do think that there's like this kind of weird I love the idea of this kind of weird, you know, sect of a uh, of uh, or kind of actor. You have like movie stars or movie actors, and you have television actors, and you have commercial actors, and you have models, and then you have the CRS guys. And the CRS guys, those are like hardcore. Those guys are like on call, twenty four hours a day. They might, they might be getting, you know, they might get a call for no reason at all they've got to like okay you're you're a paramedic today you know put this on and you know here's some bogus speak you know that you can here's some bullshit stuff you can say on this on this index card and now go be that and and these you know and they don't get paid quite as much as you know the you know i'm sure sag has like a whole like you know department that handles all the billing and stuff for the crs actors you know that's a whole other kind of thing but i love that idea that there was this weird kind of secret counterculture I think that uh, that um, David likes my voice and uh, I, I, I I know it's not my acting but he uh, he put me in this scene with Michael in the, in the bathroom where I asked for toilet paper those are my hands this is Harris's scene in the in the toilet and they had, he was very upset this day because uh, they had a video film crew uh, or there's a video camera that uh, Seon uh, was one of the producers had, which I took and put over the top of the stall and managed to take a picture of, of Harris there on the, uh, on the old toilet. The one area of the finished film that isn't really what we had written uh, pretty much starts from the scene, the first scene with Anson Bear, up to the point where the game really kicks into high gear. I think that's, that's a common thing that we, we've run across in, in our scripts getting made, is that we go to great lengths to sew up every possible hole, and then directors and actors come through and open them all up again. And then we get blamed for having a script full of holes, when, no, 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 the script really was tight. But a lot of that has to do with what's important, finally, timing rhythm moments that get built up, I think, from directors and actors' points of view that writers don't pay a lot of attention to in the script. The thing about Armin that's interesting is that he's, um, he's a guy who seems both little and big on the screen at the same time. He, there's a compassion and a kind of sm small, grandfatherly kind of thing about him that you definitely get from Avalon and there's a, and that there's also this kind of gruffness, you know, this kind of gruff kind of thing that you see a lot in in Shine or, or you know, and and I sort of saw Anson Bear, initially as. So frail and so doddering and so old, 
that you just cannot believe that this guy isn't just like going, listen, whatever it costs, you can. I mean, he's, I, I saw him as being like 94 years old. And, um, and Don Phillips and I talked about it and he said, you know what? You do, is that, is that, is that just gilding a lily? Is that making it too? I mean, is there any risk that a 94 year old is going to, is taken, you know, is come restored. back after you? There's no Bear Grant publishing. We were talking about uh, which debates or discussions uh, David and I had. And one aspect, I think, was my need or belief that we needed some comedic relief <laughs> versus David's fear of, uh, of comedic relief. And uh, we used to joke with each other. He, he calls me my, my Jerry Lewis routine where sort of starting with the whole sequence of Deborah from the uh, restaurant spilling the water and the, all the way through the ambulance um, to being chased down. All of that was an opportunity, um, uh, at least for me, to, um, uh, to attempt to try some real double takes and try to get some humor uh, in this, uh, because once again, this was a game, <laughs> and we'd established how serious this guy was. But we needed needed that uh, that aspect to it. Uh, I liked the piece with the briefcase when I couldn't open it in Anson Bear's office, and um, I think when the, the the moment afterwards, when I was trying to uh, open it, I came in for that shot. And that was an impulsive thing, and what I basically did is just threw that goddamn thing. I stomped it. I stepped on it. I smashed it. And David, I mean, it was not direct that way right at that moment. And I think he liked it. It was sort of like because I, I again felt instinctively that at that point that we needed some outburst from this guy. Some, you know, he'd been so, so wrapped up and so in control, you know, and then when he uh, he couldn't get it open, that it, it called for that kind of outburst. Excuse me, has Conrad Van Orden left a message? I'll check on it right away, Mr. Van Orden. Thank you. I wanted Deborah Unger to always, for the audience to be, for there always be to be the risk that she was going to just walk out of the movie and disappear and you'd never see her again, and that, and that she didn't matter at all. You know, I always wanted it to be like, you know, it's an extra who, you know, steps into the wrong place at the wrong time and fucks something up for the movie star and then sort of gets, you know, she's always trying to leave the movie. Every, in every scene that she's always walking out of her room and going to do something else and then coming back and saying, well, why don't we go somewhere? And what, she's always, she's always trying to escape the movie and, and she, she, the movie won't allow her to. So, um. No, I never saw it as being a... There was a love interest earlier on. There was a... Um, after he spills... After he gets wine spilled on him, they go outside, and he tries to sort of explain himself and what he thought was going on. And then this horse-drawn carriage pulled up, and then they got in the horse-drawn carriage, and they went and they had dinner in this little island out in the middle of the bay. And I just said horseshit to that. This guy's $600 million. He's not getting in a fucking carriage with anybody. <laughs> you know, he's just not... That's not... That's not the way to interest this person you know that that's not he's not incapable of stopping to smell the roses no matter how many roses you're gonna present to him it's not that's what the movie's about in a way so that that was in the original draft there was kind of a honeymoon period where they where they got him together with the waitress and i just said i don't buy it i don't buy this guy getting into a car with anybody if you got 600 million dollars in the bank you live your life a little bit more cautiously than other people you're not going to see David Geffen, no matter how many bottles of wine he spills on somebody, get in a, <laughs> get in a town car with somebody he doesn't know. Uh, I received this, uh, this note. What are you babbling about, psycho? I need to know what is going on. You want to know what's going on? I'm going on my second. When you're doing a movie, when you're in most every scene, you and the director um, really work like a team. Um, you're in sync together. And as you get into doing a picture the first or second week, you know, you have found your, 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 your strength. You found your core. So normally, as for a director to develop 
uh, the relationship with the other actors to the movie, uh, the other actors have to make the adjustments. For instance, the Deborah Unger role uh, was a very important time in the game because for my character, it was a chance to cruise. In other words, when she came in, she sort of like takes over uh, the whole thing, and we needed somebody to have that energy and stuff so I could be a reactor now, not having to go through all this stuff and let her take the picture for a while, you know, and allow me to, uh, to as I say, kind of just cruise, catch my breath, get a little second wind, let the audience not get bored looking at this guy for, um, you know, every single opportunity. But just something you talk to with uh, with a director about. I don't know this man. Here, what do you mean? Hey, I'm gonna have to detain. I think our our antecedents for the kind of controlled environment things that CRS is doing, also things like The Prisoner, uh, The Avengers, that a lot of those classic '60s and '70s paranoid controlled environment stories are what CRS is is kind of running on. That that's a lot of what they're out to do are these perfect setups that convince somebody that something is the case when in fact it isn't. Uh, for example, the scene where the ambulance pulls in and suddenly all the lights go out. It's, you know, a really convincing portrayal of reality, but it's not. Let's just talk to someone who can get this over with, shall we? Hang on. In my world, this is totally doable. In fact, if the fact that you're seeing it at all means that it can be done and in fairly inexpensively. <laughs> if it has a chance of making it in a movie, it's, you know, it can be done cost effectively. But uh, that's not a real hospital. It's a set. I think it's been on, on 15 or 16 TV shows since we built it in this place. This is an old uh, 76, you know, um, Union 76 building in downtown LA that had a great parking garage and we just built that Mercy Hospital San Francisco uh, wall and put up the neon and and uh, put a bunch of police cars and gurneys and stuff in the and there's you know 35 extras and hospitals are us again I like the idea of roping somebody in but it's you know he's not you know, the guy falls down and pretends to have a heart attack. And then, and they're hoping he's going to, like, stop and try to give CPR, stop and try to help, but he doesn't. So then she has to come back and sort of push that along. And then she says, get help, get help. And then they send the, the police car by, and he flags the police car down, and the police car calls the fake ambulance, and the ambulance shows up. But from the audience's point of view, from Michael Douglas's point of view, all of this stuff is happening, all this stuff's legit. Where'd y'all go, motherfucker? Jeffrey Beecroft. Now, when we built the hospital, uh, David had asked that we could see the cables and things like that behind the walls. There was going to be, he was going to actually take them into the hospital set, but that didn't happen. Uh, so this is a scene shot in Los Angeles. All the lines here, all the fluorescents are directing you in a line. When you look at them, they're all going somewhere. You're being told where to go all the time. Your eye is being told where to look. And David is great at point of view of a camera. And, and what I was trying to do is enhance that. So that if he has to go to the elevator, you see a line of fluorescence going towards that elevator, or the elevator opens in the darkness, and there's a light there at the end, and that's where you have to go. He keeps being told throughout the film which direction he has to go. He doesn't have a choice. Michael Ferris. We always imagined that CRS would have a backup plan, a contingency plan in any circumstance. I mean, uh, a lot of people took the film to task for saying, well, they couldn't possibly have anticipated that he would do each of the things he did that leads him to the next the next stage of the game. Uh, but the idea was always that, well, no, they haven't. They've anticipated any number of possible things he might do, and they have a different set of, uh, of circumstances in place in the event that he does that. Now, of course, you can't necessarily communicate that on screen without going backstage at CRS, as it were, and we've made a decision very early on not to do that. That would have to be told entirely from uh, the player's perspective. John Brancato. CRS is very largely like a computer game that you can see it as a series of decision trees, that they try to probably prepare for what he might do under a given circumstance. I mean, if you turn to the left, you'll get one set of experiences. If you turn to the right, you'll get a different one. And that it's like moving through a house set in a computer game 
that, you know, if he, if he takes one step, then there'll be a series of programmed possibilities. If he takes a different one, there'll be a different set. But that I think at least one of the critics who, who saw it re recognized how much this was based on playing computer games, that a lot of its logic isn't sort of traditional narrative, but rather decision trees and, you know, game theory of how if you do one thing, then that means the next thing will happen, and then you have this little branching experience in game with okay. different, and then you can bring him back to the main line at different points. There was talk of turning this into a CD-ROM interactive computer game at some point or another, but I, I gather it fell by the wayside. No. Oh, please. I'm not wearing any underwear. Okay, there I said it. Again, the main thing that, that CRS is trying to do is relinquish him of all control. When he thinks that what he's going to do is push her up in there, she's going to force him to go up into the dark by himself. So she comes up with whatever it is that she wants. Whatever she wants, I mean, in reality, she's wearing underwear. You can actually see it in the shots where she's hanging off. The, but she's going to tell him anything that's going to force him to not get it the way he wants which is, okay, I'll help you, I'll push you up and you can get through the hatch and you can get up, up top of the elevator and you can, and she's like, no, 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 I can't do that. Why not? Well, my way makes the most sense. I'm the strongest, I can help you up. No, 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 I can't, I, I don't have any underwear on. So now he has to go up and do this thing. It's just, he never gets to, he never gets to do it his way. We'll drop from here. He says, no, we won't. So then she drops. Now he has to drop. He's got no, there's no choice, you know? So it's like, it's all about, you have no control over your life. All the control you thought you had is now gone. We're taking it away from you. Even if we have to like, you know, lie to you about cheese ball stuff in order to get you to play it our way. She leads him up onto the thing. They walk along. He's got to go up into the, the window. She then leads him to the to the fire escape. I mean, there's nothing that she doesn't, like, lead the way in. She goes down the alley the first time. She runs away from the dog. She gets up on the... I mean, he's following her the whole time. But she's making it look like she's trying to escape his game. This alleyway is actually interesting because it's totally manipulated, you know? What happens in the alley is that the walls are brought in tighter or they're opened up so that he comes through and it co continually changes the environment. David had this idea here of the, of the city looming behind him, so we built all this environment right here in, a, in an empty parking lot and uh, so that light was, was piercing through. So again, remember how we were moving the camera and it makes it seem to move faster by strobing. So what I did is we put the slats in. David wanted pieces of board and then I found this texture just chain link and we started just dropping in grape steak in between it and we put I used a lot of visqueen and 12 monkeys and we liked that and and uh, gloss uh, and so I started using that a lot in this sequence I thought it worked really well with the reflection so there's a lot of plastic in here a lot of artificial things if you look up this is also the seven alley we also call this Taco Bell alley you know because of all the commercials and stuff we've done or Levi's Alley is the other alley. This sequence is made up of two different alleys, plus some stuff on stage, so. Uh, and then the dog, obviously. It's a very scary environment, part of kind of the underbelly of Chinatown. Uh, Steve Golan gave me a script, um, the Ferris and Mercado script that was, uh, that MGM had bought years ago. Um, he had bought it from MGM, and, and um, he said, I got the script I want you to read. It's called The Game, and I was kind of like, Oh God, it's going to be like an, the most dangerous game. It's going to be a, a retelling of that. I like the script and I lo love the twists and turns and I love the, I love the drugging scene. I love the scene where, where Deborah or where Christine drugs him. I thought, wow, that's really genius because you're just, you're so worked up by that point to like, and you just, you hate it. You know, you hate the moment. You just go, oh, God, why didn't I fucking see that? And I love the, uh, and I love the shootout at the house with the, um, you know, I thought that that whole thing, the whole middle section, you know, it's very rare that you find a movie in the middle section of it works. <laughs> you know, I just didn't quite buy the setup or the, or the, 
or the ending with it being, you know, with shooting your, your, actually, I think he shoots Christine. So, and I told Scotland, what if we have a guy who's Scrooge, who's just dead, who doesn't have anybody in his life, and back into his life comes somebody who should mean something to him, but he's holding off at a distance, and that person gives him this experience, and, and then the thing plays out against him, <laughs> or to him. I think visually, Fincher really got the rhythms of the rich down right. I mean, this, it, it feels very sumptuous, it feels very cold and isolated and, and very rich. Uh, in, our initial, uh, in our initial draft, he was a much nicer guy. Uh, we were sort of responding to, you know, perceived Hollywood wisdom. You sort of figure you want to have a sympathetic main character in your movie. And I think Fincher's decision to move it much more in a Scrooge direction, make this uh, a Christmas Carol type story, was a smart one. Uh, it was a gutsy one, and I don't think, you know, every director could have gotten away with it or could have, you know, been given the freedom to do it that way. Able to, please. I'm looking for anything that's going to help me tell my story. You know, people go, oh, well, you know, are you all caught up in the, in the costuming and the photography and all that? It's like I'm caught up in the miking. You know, I'm caught up in the clothes they wear, the shoes they wear, the contrast between the shoes that they wear and the clothes that they wear. All of those things help to tell you who these people are. You know, so all those things, it, there's not, there's, it's not flashy. The pinky ring, you know, Michael Kaplan, the costume designer, was insisting on this pinky ring. He was like, pinky rings, it's got to be pinky rings. Guys, you know, who, this is old money. This is, you know, Harvard, Stanford, Yale kind of, you know, those guys wear pinky rings. And he was right. It's a great little touch and it's a great little thing that Michael gets to play with. And it's this little kind of flash on his hand that you see. And it's like, it's not a mafiosa type thing. It doesn't come across that way. It comes across as this kind of, you know, boys club kind of thing. When he's in the gentleman's club with all the hardwood and the leather and the cigars and, you know, it's this kind of tobacco kind of place, you know, the pinky ring fits in perfect there, you know, with the, with the, uh, Shivas. No, I'm an investment banker. I move money from one place to another. <laughs> I hate the red bra scene. We, we shot that scene three times, trying to f trying to figure out. Initially, it's a much longer scene, and there's a lot, and you found out a lot more about her yeah, in it. Right. But um, it didn't play very well. It seemed like it seemed like a setup. You know, uh, there was a scene where she talked about look, the beautiful view out his windows, and, and he says, I never look out them, and she says, you ought to, and, and she talks about, you know, if I had an office like this, I'd, you know, there's all these kinds of layers of stuff, but it seemed like a big wind-up. It seemed like it drew way too much attention to her, and you sort of went, she, she's setting him up for something. And, and, and it wasn't what they were saying, it's that they were stopping to talk about that they were stopping to smell the roses at all at that moment made you, made the audience go on alert. And, um, and it just ultimately felt inappropriate. I mean, that's the way I felt then. I, I might feel differently now. I don't know if I had to watch a movie. <laughs> I might go, you know, what this movie really needs is a few more moments where they stop and smell the roses. But I, I at the time, just felt I wanted to just be very clean and, and get on with the lies, you know? Screenwriters John Brancato and Michael Ferris. Michael Ferris. Early in the, uh, well, at some point in the development process, they, they were asking us questions like, well, what's the movie about? What's the theme? Which, of course, you hate hearing in a development meeting. So our, response, our initial response was, well, life's a joke. And, uh, and we were quickly called, you can't say that. You know, that's, not, you can't, that's not what a movie's about. You go, okay, no, it's, that's not life's a joke. We were, we were kidding about that. Uh, but um, It's why is the tragedy of life a comedy? Because it has a happy ending. Director David Fincher. This film, for me, is a, was an interesting study, not in human behavior and how people relate to each other or what people want from life or a career or any of that. It was, what does an audience want or expect or need from a film? My question was, how much will they put up with? And, you know, like, will they go for 45 minutes of red herrings? Only, you know, I was reading the script and I was like, I got to this point where Deborah says, 
Don't you get it? It's all about fucking money, you idiot. And you go, oh, it can't be. That can't be it. And then you go, wait a minute. What did they do for the first 18 pages? They just told me how fucking rich this guy is. They kept telling me what they were going to do. And then they went off and they did. And they, and they told me that it was this other thing, that it was this other experience, that it was bigger and more profound and more far-reaching than just getting his money. And then they bring it back around and then she goes, no, that's not it at all. It's just about money. I just, you know, I got, when I read the script, I just got giddy because I was just like, this is just so great that you just go, no, 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 let's t do this personality profile. Let's, let's find out what kind of a person you are. Let's delve into your psyche. Let's, let's uh, find out the things that interest you. Let's find out what your heart rate is, what your blood pressure is like, what kind of physical stamina you have. Let's do this. Let's show you these pictures and see how you, how you behave. And let's, and then let's, then let's not let you know that the game's begun and tell you that you can't play and, and do all these things. And then, and then once, once we tell you that the game has started, then you're going to be on your toes, and then we're not going to do anything for a while because you're going to be finding meaning in things that don't have any meaning. And then you get all, around, you get all the way around the fucking bend with the thing, and it gets back to, oh, yeah, remember page one where we told you how fucking rich this guy is? That's what it's all about. And I love that. And then I love the fact that it wasn't about that, that there was kind of a... There was something else. That's what the game is for me, is like, what, what's the storyteller or the story or the, f the venue's responsibility to the audience? Production designer Jeffrey Beecroft. Now we're going to go into a place that is not controlled again by Nicholas. And if you notice, David took us through kind of a labyrinth. You go through a labyrinth. You go through another little maze. But when he gets up to the room, the ceilings are smashed down on him again, and he starts to panic before you get to where he's meant to focus to look, you know, which is the table. Michael Douglas. We talk about it before we go in and you see the principal objects and he wants you to make sure that you make contact with that. In this particular sequence in the, in the hotel room, seeing the disarray, number one, number two is the female clothes, number three is my briefcase, number four is these Polaroid pictures, number five is the cocaine. So, you're, so you want to make sure, uh, as you described, that you're going to be, you, you have specific looks that you know you have to make directionally uh, for him to add his inserts later on. Director of Photography, Harris Savides. We had a little second unit working towards the end of the movie, but most of the little inserts we did ourselves. And it's, it's nice to have that luxury. Well, what we would do is at the end of the day, usually, when we'd release Michael and, and uh, we'd continue shooting and pick up all the little scenes we needed. We just worked until we got it done. I've always wanted to do that, to too, to the cleaning later? people in hotels. The, the pictures themselves are actually pretty amazing and highly erotic and... We did those in the actual hotel room like four months before we shot the scene. Michael Douglas came in and we had all the pictures laid out and he goes, God, I never get to be there for any of the fun stuff. I was like, <laughs> he's the, we had a body double for him. Well, I, I, I kept looking at all these, these uh, Polaroid pictures that of course only David could take um, of this uh, orgy that had been going on. And uh, again, this was a sequence where I asked, I didn't want to see the set uh, before I got there. Uh, I just think it's, it's just more helpful. Uh, and this is the kind of thing I'd rather just get our, our marks. This is a steady cam shot, a lot of this uh, for me, and then a tremendous amount of insert work for them. Screenwriter John Brancato. No one has had more control than David Fincher over what was happening. He really knew what he wanted to get. And he had a complete laser-like focus to realize exactly what it was he wanted. Jeffrey Beecroft. Once you, once, I feel like once you kind of lay down your concept and how you're going to implement it and your color palette, then you can always go back to that. You, it is basically your map to make a movie. Look at it again, here's reflections being used by David so well. You're seeing through glass. You're seeing reflection across his face. Now here he is, he's going through the maze of, of the city that he knows, but he is now taking this guy into his environment. We're now in the wealthy part of town. 
uh, the financial district, which we've seen before, that is Van Orton's territory, and he's going to take this guy down an alley and take his gun. We basically brought in all the trash cans so we could make the air of the alley narrower. We wet it all down so you could get dark and, and have reflections. But uh, also, this is an area where the sun the sun doesn't uh, penetrate the um, this canyon very often. So it was, uh, I think, like 12 noon, and you're not getting any light in this alleyway at all. David David and Harris really planned out when they were going to shoot scenes and what kind of light was going to come in. And David's very detailed about it. My responsibility is to is to place your eyes where I think is the best place to, and I there usually in any given situation there aren't two places for that. There's usually one good place and then there's one compromised place. You know where you go. Well, I can look like I got another setup. You know I start from from a third party omniscient place. You know like where in the scene can we uh, where can we begin? that shows you what's going on and then kind of work in terms of, well, what, what does the person, I'm also f always following Michael. So, you know, like in the scene where he's walking down the hall with his attorney, we're going to go off the attorney and onto Michael as he goes to the door to confront Anson Bear. But filmmaking isn't, you know, it's like if you could just strap a camera onto an actor and, you know, steady cam and like point it at their face and follow them through a movie. That's not what movie making is, you know, that's not what it's about. It's not just about getting a performance, and just it's also about the psychology of of uh, the cinematic moment and, and the and the the psychology of the presentation of that, that window. Where's that window? Where does the where I'm taking your eye and I'm gonna put your eye someplace. And if I and if I, there's a dialogue scene going on between Michael Douglas and Sean Penn and I for some reason take your eye and I decide to put it down here on the table real low so you can read that birthday card that it, I better have a fucking pretty good reason why I'm doing that, you know? Do I need to see that? Everything's on a need to know basis. What does the audience need to know? You know? And, and how does that fit into the style? You know, this, is, this movie is, again, disassociated and, and, and supposedly designed to leave room for, or it was intended to design, to, the design of it was intended to leave room for the, for the characters in the movie, the actors, to state their case. And you believe them or you don't believe them, whatever, depending on how good they do it or how good I do it or how, how the pieces that we pick to show you that's what all we wanted to do is just let them state their case like that. You know the sh the shot of the the attorney throwing down the pictures in the in the scene. It's like, do you have to go to that? Well, it's not really about seeing the information on the Polaroids as much as it's it's his flourish. It's just like a little ch and Michael looks at it and you can kind of cut away to the to the POV of it, but. That was kind of a, you don't need, you didn't really need to do that. But it's kind of, we wanted to see that there was a picture of somebody who looked like Michael in there. What do you know? Uh, wait a minute, they gave me a waiver. I'm fairly rigid about how I'm going to tell the story. Look, you know, I don't think there's anybody in the world has more respect for actors than I do. I mean, I think they're incredibly valuable tools at helping you tell a story. But actors don't tell the story. Actors aren't the story. The character is not the story. The character is one of the people in the story. The character is the characters that they can play. They can help you to do these things, but they're not... The movie is not about Michael Douglas. It's about Michael Douglas's character, but the story in and of itself is not just following Michael Douglas's character. It's all of the... It's all of the other things around that in addition to that. You know, there's, it's, if you're, if you're constantly, you know, it's a, it's a fine line. You know, it's a, it's, you're, you're, you're using people that people want to invest in when you get a movie star. Michael Douglas is a color, you know, in a way. I mean, you're kind of, I come to things, you know, I look at my responsibility as I should be able to get the scene if I have to do it with wooden Indians, <laughs> you know.
if nobody, if everybody shows up embalmed, I want to be able to have figured out where the story is, where the moment is. When Michael Douglas, as a, as a, as a, as Nicholas Van Orton says to his brother, you know, uh, this is what I think about your, this gift that you've just given me. I'm creating a moment. I know where that moment's coming in the text. I've underlined and I go, that's the moment where we need to see how he feels about this present. And we need to see that he doesn't really want to get involved. That is kind of out of guilt that he's going to, that he's going to agree to go, you know, go and check this thing out anyway. Um, I know that where that's happening in the text, that's the moment for that. And I know I have to be on him for that because I know I can't tell that, that story over his shoulder. So he and I have discussed that. I also know that I've got a scene, a dialogue, five-page dialogue scene that's taking place at a table. I also know what lenses I want to use in order to, in the medium shots, show the proper distance and put these guys on the edge of frame. And I also know from a, you know, experience standpoint what the medium, you know, I know I'm going to have three sizes. I'm going to have a wide over, a tight over, and a, and a tight single on each of them and I know cosmetically what a 75 millimeter lens is going to do and that's what I'm going to shoot my my uh, Warner Brothers close up on and I know that on a 40 I'm going to get a piece a sliver of of the other person I also know that I'm going to be much more on the eye line in the 40 millimeter than I am in the 27 which is going to record the whole table and the whole room the feel of the whole room but I also know that I'm going to be using these three sizes and shooting multiple takes of it because I'm going to be allowing them in the wide one to give me these weird little things that they want to do. So I've said to them, no, your character doesn't stand up and walk over to the window and light a cigarette. You're just sitting down having lunch. So we agree on that, you know, I, and, and I've never lit and I've gone and I've prepped the location and I've never ever said to anybody, who knows, they may want to walk over to the window. So if somebody comes to me and says, hey, I think my character would get up and walk to the window, I would go, no, 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 no. <laughs> you're, you're sorely mistaken. No, you sit, at this ta you sit at this table and you have lunch. That's what you're doing. So, so it, you know, it's kind of you figured it out and then you shoot the 27 millimeter and then they do these things and Michael does this great thing where he puts all the stuff back into the envelope and he puts the envelope away and he's kind of talking to him without really looking at him and, and you go, yeah, that's great. That helps tell my story. You're helping me tell my story. But you're not telling my story. I'm telling my story. You know? And that's how... That's... You know, you're the oboe. And this is a part written for the oboe. But I'm the conductor. You know? And when I go like this, you go like this. <laughs> you know, that that's what it is. It's not a... And it's not a... And it should never be an antagonistic thing, you know? I mean... I've never worked with an actor who thought this whole thing is about my character and my process or anything. And that's one of the great gifts of working with Michael Douglas is you work with somebody who sees the overview oftentimes a lot clearer than you do because you get so bogged in minutia. And there's times when, you know, he will, you know, so sagely say, hey, 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 you know, the audience just wants to know what time it is. They don't want to know how a watch works. This was a horrendously long movie. We shot, I think, 108 days. I shot, or I think, well, I think I shot 107 out of 108. I think what we were the happiest with is this picture in particular, because we were so far out of continuity. Uh, and I, when I asked David, you know, or David mentioned to me what he'd heard about me before, he talked to Jim Brooks, who had produced The War of the Roses, and he said, well, the one good thing about Michael is he always knows where he is in the movie, which is usually a big problem for directors. Actors tend to be involved in the moment in however they feel that day, rather than saying, well, gee, where will this fit in the overall scheme of things? If I shoot uh, uh, this one scene today, and then the next scene in the movie I'm going to shoot in four months, from now, you know, how do you maintain uh, the level, the degrees to know where you're at? The phone doesn't work, I can't get a signal. Really? And you begin to just have in your head, da 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 da, da bah, and you have, you have a feeling about it, all this or where, where it is, so I, I think it has a lot to do about tempo. And I don't like to rely on the fact that there are some actors, the other style is there's actors who act very slow. 
very slowly because they put it up to the editor, allow the editor, the film editor, and the director to sort of cut their performances together. I like to act in real time. And uh, sometimes I act too fast. You know, I, I end up sort of moving along. And sometimes I tend to, when you're doing these kind of pictures where you have the responsibility of the movie where you're in every single scene, I give too much of myself away for the movie. Uh, this was a constant debate with, uh, with David and I on the game. Uh, as, as well plotted as this piece was, um, I, I knew that unless they cared about Nicholas Van Oort, unless they felt that he did have a heart, they wouldn't care. People wouldn't care. And we would always struggle on the edge of being too cold and too removed um, versus being emotional. And one of the things I admire about David is uh, his lack of the easy tug on emotions. He's, uh, he, he tends to, to uh, limit himself in terms of expressing emotion, sharing emotion. It doesn't use that as a trump card. You're painting yourself into a corner with this movie. You're painting yourself into it because you're going, hey, God, I hope people still want to... I mean, he's kind of an asshole. I wonder if... I hope people still care about him at the end. You know, I hope they care about what these people are doing to him. I hope that, you know, it's like the scene where Sean runs away from the scene on the steps where they, you're like sitting there going, I'm not, I don't really know what this argument's about. I kind of know it, but I just met this guy. And now I'm sort of like along for the ride. And, and he's going through whatever kind of emotional situation with his brother. And, but I do know that his car's been tampered with and somebody's blown his tire out and they've painted his house and things are, things are getting weird. So, you know, and hopefully, hopefully by staying with this very rigid point of view, you're going to make things more tense than if you bumped around and said, you can cut to the guys, you know, at the windows with the binoculars and the night scopes going, he's going down the stairs, she's following you, keep it up, you're doing a good job, Sean, you know. Just get past that laundromat, if we can just get him into the laundromat, we'll be fine. There are many, there are a lot of things about this guy that most people can't relate to. But there's a lot of things about him that I think a lot of people can, you know. And I think that's, you know, and that was the thing Michael brings to it is that he understands that even assholes have a sense of humor and even people who are emotionally cut off and, and you know, kind of, you know, touch deprived or whatever are, are, you know, have sort of, sort of some of the same outlooks on things that we have, you know. I mean, when he's trapped in the cab, you kind of go, I can relate to that. And, you know, he's screaming in the backseat as he gets kind of flopped around. And, you know, we've all taken cab rides in New York where you just go, I'm not going to survive this. I really, really, I love you, Dad. I love you, Mom. <laughs> Buddy, you missed the turn. The cab ride was, you know, pretty religiously storyboarded, you know, fairly specific. You know, we, 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 we went through just to lay out the things that we needed to see. You know, we needed to see the bridge off in the distance with the lights on. And, you know, we, we knew those kinds of things just so you would know you're getting closer and closer and closer so that the water didn't come as a total surprise. Um, but, but it's pretty straightforward. This stuff's pretty... You know, stunts in movies and action sequences are... You kind of send out for that stuff like pizza, you know. It's kind of like, I'll have a number 12. With, not only can I do this in my sleep, in fact, a lot of the sequence was shot in my sleep. No, you you, you just... You don't see car crashes and, and chases and, you know, stuff in movies a lot because... It's really difficult. <laughs> you see it because it's fairly, you know, stock exciting and, 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 you know, and, and there's guys out there and you just, you know, which way do you want the car to roll when it goes off the end of the pier and which way? It's pretty easy stuff. What I liked was the idea of instead of a guy who's, you know, a man of action was the idea that, you know, the accountant with the gun, you know, trapped in the back seat and trying to figure out how can this be part of it? This seems a little, this is going too far. I 
again, this is not a movie about real life. This is a movie about movies, you know. And and they're kind of putting this guy in a movie, and he's not. <laughs> he's not acting like a movie star. He's like, he runs away. He you know flips out. He goes in and curses little old men out, and he knows exactly what's going on, and he has no idea what's going on. And I I just thought it was funny. I just thought he was, you know. I mean, I find myself, you know, I mean, there's a lot about Nicholas Van Orn that I relate to, you know, having been through a divorce and, you know, having, you know, and trying to figure out what it is that you want, you know, trying to figure out how much control you should have over your own life, how much, you know, you know, when you, when you do reach those, you know, really painful and ugly, you know, periods of your life, you... You, know, you have to sort of ask yourself, do I ever want to do this again? And if so, why? You know, or, or or how do I avoid it? Or what are the pitfalls? What do I watch for? What are the indications? And, you know, and I think that Nicholas, because he's so wealthy, you know, chooses, goes a certain way that a lot of us don't have choice of, where he just throws a lock on the front gate and doesn't let anybody in over the wall. And, uh, you know, I think that's kind of, you know, I, 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 I can, I could relate to this guy. I could relate to the idea of having your life kind of put together in such a way that maybe it was a little boring and you're coming home and you're watching too much TV and you're, but at least it's like, there's nothing, there's no new pain, you know, there's no new. And, and I think that people, we go through those times, you know, people go through those times where they just, you know, secede from the union, you know, I didn't, I, he's so much more likable than he was in the script, I mean, and Michael brought all that, you know, Michael brought, you know, whatever humor is there, and I think there's a lot, you know, that's all Michael Douglas, because he was pretty straightforward, pretty, just no time for anybody, no time for anybody's bullshit. Except... You said you hired these guys. That's irrelevant. No, look. It's our job to tell you what we've got. So far, we don't have motive. This scene with Carol Baker in the kitchen of my mansion, I, I think was designed to give the first hint uh, that Nicholas Van Orton is beginning to come around. He was just on my mind. Your mother loved your father very much. I think he just worked too hard. Was he uh, morose? I mean... What I remember most was that his manner was so... And I think that's why it was you know, strategically placed where it is. Not even know that he'd been there. The rehearsal process was uh, basically um, sitting around a table, talking through the scenes, and on the walls around us were photographs in detail of all the sets, of all locations. And it's the first time I've ever seen it done, and it was very, very helpful. So, you you know, between breaks, you'd kind of get up and you could look at the locations that you were going to film. You could look at the sets, the, the, the places. Harris Civiti, our, uh, our cameraman, sat in a lot of times. I was very impressed to see a cameraman uh, as often, just sit in a room listening to actors act, enough, nothing for him to light, and he was great. It was, it was a nice time. During this uh, shootout scene, um, it, we're keeping that one light approach here again, where this is lit with pretty much one light on a condor coming from camera left and very high, and uh, angled at a point where it's catching the buildings. Gives it that very stark, very graphic kind of uh, look. And it's always uh, on the other side of the lens, uh, facing. At night, it's always good to put the light on the uh, opposite side of the lens. So you're shooting into it as much as possible. It's the nicest look. And once again, this is practicals. Everything's lit from the top. It was David's intention to... Um, to come up with a viewfinder that would allow us to shoot uh, the Super 35 format 
and protect the TV format as much as possible to eliminate as much pan and scan as po as we could, because uh, ultimately this um, this movie will be shown more on tape and on TV than it does in the theater. And uh, we designed a ground glass that has a uh, common center but a lower common top than the typical Super 35. Let me tell you about these. Is this you? Where'd you get them? My hotel room. It's interesting because in the, in the pan scan version, it's actually a wider movie. It's more distance. It doesn't have as much of a close-up feel. And yet, most people would say that it's smaller, or that the, 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 uh, the picture's actually bigger because on the pan scan, or because on the letterbox, it's, you, you're seeing so much on the edges, that the, the actual head size of a person's head, but if you were able to see a TV screen that you didn't have the cropping top and bottom on, you would see that, that, the, uh, that the image itself is, is actually wider in the, uh, in the pan scan version, which is usually completely the opposite, because normally, you know, when you're dealing with anamorphic, you're not only chopping the sides up, but you're also chopping the top and bottom off. So it becomes all about faces and close-ups. It's an interesting phenomenon. It's, and it does change, totally changes the tone of the movie completely. The framing is, you know, I think that the pan scan version of the movie is a different, slightly different movie, a little bit more, it's almost a little bit more coy in a weird way. It comes across differently. It doesn't seem as sort of serious in a very strange way. When I first read the script, the, this, the scene in the house with the, uh, with the price tag, when he discovers that, that the whole house has basically been set decorated, that for me was, that's, that's when I said, gotta see this, gotta make this movie. Because it just seemed like such a, it was such a, um, I was not expecting to have the rug pulled out from under me in that, in that respect. I kept thinking, oh, okay, I think she's in it, I think she's in on it, which of course means that she isn't in on it. And then to find out that she is and that it's <laughs> done in such a kind of ham-fisted way, you know, it's, I love that. And then her whole, shut up, it's a con, can't you see that, you idiot? Screenwriter Michael Ferris. Another major element we let go of at, at Fincher's insistence was um, more of a real love story between uh, the Nicholas character and Christina, the waitress. And again, I think that was a good call. I mean, I think it was a call Fincher made because he just had no interest in directing that kind of more conventional Hollywood love story angle. And again, I think it's something we put in sort of as a sop to traditional filmmaking, that there has to be a love story somewhere in the center of this because it's, it's a movie. Um, and the movie didn't really need it. And the relationship between him and the waitress, I think, plays a lot more believably, more credibly by giving her a harder edge and not trying to introduce some, you know, some some sappy romance in the uh, in the middle of the movie. I I tend to tell Cindy off print. I don't like to tell Cindy off an inner positive. Um, uh, I like to coming off a low con because I like the tactile. I like the grain. I like the tactile sense of the film, and I also like. Um, the the gamma the the set gamma I like dealing with print stock because with an IP stock you end up or negative stock you end up jamming it to get so much contrast that what happens is that you have you have very little leeway in terms of color you you're you're the the CCD or that's you know whatever it is that's that's interpolating the the image is um because you're driving the contrast so high that any, you know, you get into the gold, you get into like a yellowish kind of tungsten light, um, it goes green or red so fast. And, and you know, it can go green and red in the same frame, you know, in the same, the background can be a blonde wood in, and with warm light on it and one side of the screen is green and one other side is red and there's no shading or, the, you, know, it's, you know, it's all been set up properly, it's just, you have to drive it, overdrive it so much with contrast that any variation is picked up. So I tend to tell Cindy from print stock, but we had to go back to IP on certain scenes. They were just too dense. So we did that, you know, very selective stuff. It's a very, very complicated process with this movie, you know, trying to make sure that, you know, you had to reframe 
for close-ups, you know, and make sure that they were big enough because when they're 60 feet across or 40 feet across, it's a much different thing than when they're 19 inches across. And, you, you know, it's all those things. Like, how much do we blow it up? And at what point do you start to see too much tactile film nonsense? Um, in this scene, this is an example of something that we didn't tell us any. Actually, we did a lot of, there are a lot of, you know, we shot the movie, it seems like, in a lot of days, but we shot as quickly as we could, you know, in some cases there's mics still in shot, and we had to take those out, and, you know, I think in the, uh, I originally wanted in this, in the scene where they run across the, the rooftop at, at Christine's and they're firing at him with machine guns, I didn't want to see the squibs blowing the dust, I just wanted to see the impact of the bullets, I didn't want to see sparks but there there was no way to do that but in the laser disc condition we went in and painted all the sparks out so you just see the little clouds of dust special effects supervisor kevin hogue once we started shooting david realized that uh he wanted to see some damage done to the car when he's running away from christine's house um, so we wanted to see some something happen to the car. So Doc and I went out and we watched them shoot plates. Um, and it was sort of anticipated we'd do some big um, CG something maybe or some sort of special effects thing maybe someday with that car. By the time we got to the end of the uh, the show, uh, we ended up with six frames, which I think Fincher once said might, might possibly be the six most expensive frames in history, uh, where it's just a quick pan, you watch the house go by in the background, you're close on the top of the car, and you see the bullet holes rip through the top of the car. And the bullet holes in the long run, because it was really only six frames, we made a CG thing which the compositors then tracked onto the surface of the car, and, and we went out and we shot special sparks that would hit as it hits the top of the car. Uh, it was like last minute, we went out and got all these things and put them together so that we could get it in there. So you have the, the impact. You see it hit because of the sparks, and then you see the grooves in the top of the car so you can feel that he's actually getting shot at by somebody. Six frames is all we needed. <laughs> you want to know? Because if I'm gone, you never will. We weren't trying to fulfill any kind of thematic conceit with, with regards to, um, you know, Christine's house, the locations, or the alleys in and around it. It was more just trying to find a place in L.A. that looked like Petrero Hill. Because San Francisco is a very, I mean, the streets are all very small, and they're all very, it's, it is very circuitous. You know, there's like a lot of, because you're kind of building on hills, so everything sort of kind of comes down and goes to the right or to the left and kind of can, repeats and moves around. But um, this, the, the chase from Christine's house was shot in L.A., and we were just looking for places that looked like Petrero Hill. How do they get to him? Same thing to him they did to you. Oh, what are you talking about, then? Checked your accounts. Night in your office. I got the number to your private. I was never. I was never tempted to to um, pay any kind of homage to to specific movies. But I was always aware of the fact that the moot that the game that they create for him has a kind of movie logic, or it deals with movie stakes. You know, the big heist, the big con. The, you know, the, the accidental shooting of somebody very important, the big fall, the big, you know, I mean, it's kind of dealing with these, again, movie set pieces, the drugging of him, you know, these are things that don't happen in real life, you know, in real life and people steal from other people, they don't drug them and leave, they shoot them <laughs> and, they, and they go on about their business. It's not really... You know, it's only in the movies that it's that it's important to rub somebody's nose in it. It's like, you know, in real life, it's like the money's the thing and everybody splits down and they divide it later. But um, so there is, I mean, it, I mean, he is trapped in a movie. I mean, that's what they, that's what they offer him. You know, that's what CRS does. That's this personal adventure. And that's kind of what any of our, you know, it's like, I don't know if today, in this day and age, if if your personal, if somebody said to you, here's your chance to do, here's your personal adventure, you get to go around the world in a balloon. And, you know, if people would go, I'll sign up for that. You know, it's like, wait a minute, I have to sit alone in the dark, freezing my ass off for th 15 days or something? It's like, mm, I don't think so. You know, people want something that's more kind of like, 
intricate and involving. And so in that respect, I, I always thought that the movie was a, about movie making or about, you know, a guy allowing himself or paying people or going out of his way to be trapped in kind of movie thinking. And I think that's kind of the fun of the movie for me is that it's constantly you're, you're sitting there going, OK, well, we've met. All right. So there's the Polaroid during the in the penthouse so that has something to do with this and that's going to tie back and then and then like i say she she comes in halfway through the movie and goes oh that that was just to keep you distracted while we ripped off your cash she's just like here's your coffee she and she's also working trying to kind of go let me tell you a little bit about myself and he's like who fucking cares <laughs> yeah i like that the reluctant hero and the reluctant villainous Deborah Unger is a, um, is a talented actress, and she was a, uh, a long shot uh, for the, the part. Um, David asked me to look at a, uh, an audition or a tape of her for, for, you know, to see her for the film, and the tape was for the movie Crash, and, and, and it comprised about three minutes of her fornicating. And about 19 positions, I thought, is this a joke? This is what her agent's sending out as her take. But she came in, and she had all the right qualities uh, for the part. She had a yes. great sense of humor. She was, uh, you could believe her as a waitress. She was, she was attractive. But David was trying to have all the other characters in the movie sort of unidentifiable so that as the game went on, you didn't know who was going to be an important role model or character who wasn't. You just didn't know. And so she she had that, you know, and she had the kind of energy, she had the humor that I was looking for because I felt that that role was really important um, to uh, to have that. Uh, and uh, and I, I think when she got the part, it was like, oh, my God, now I've got the part. And a lot of that initial energy and humor um, was, was, was brought way down in her performance. She became, she got smaller and smaller. I mean, ultimately, uh, I think she came off very, very well in the picture. How did they get to him? Why did I? I wouldn't worry about it. The drug POVs, it wasn't enough for him to just perform being knocked out or being drugged that you needed to have some kind of so we did this thing where um julian watley who's the assistant cameraman got the zoom out and loosened it all up and then he just zoomed in and out really really quickly and what we did was put it on a computer and average the um the zooming so that what we were doing was kind of counter countering the zoom so we were blowing it up when when it was zooming out, and we were and we were reducing it down when it was zooming in. So we were kind of going in the opposite. And what it does is, if you throw it off by a frame or so, it gives this kind of wobbly, makes the whole picture kind of look liquid and kind of, and uh, you know, it's a totally spazzy, completely stupid trick that just I don't know. I just thought it kind of looked like, you know, it had that kind of like. I don't know, just I hadn't seen it before, you know, it wasn't wasn't the uh the crash zoom, the Hitchcock crash zoom. Originally, he wakes up in a garbage heap, which I always thought was pretty great. But, but, but I, again, keeping with the idea of, of rebirth, I thought it was good that he would come out of a mausoleum, that he would come out of the idea of being in a crypt with, you know, in, in dressed in your, in your finest white linens, <laughs> you know, re ready for the south of the border, you know, burial. I like the idea, literally, from coming out of the ground, of it being like you know he like wakes up with like coffee grounds up his nose and he's in a, a garbage. But I, but I, you know, but I, I just thought it was almost too much. It was just too little, too ugly. And and I like the idea of like 
waking up in this enclosed space and popping the lid off it and finding out you're in a coffin seemed to me like one of those just icky ideas that you just go. Just the realization of that would be make you go. Ugh. I actually uh, grew up uh, in New York. Uh, my folks got divorced when I was five. And I'm actually not a filmophile. I, I don't know a lot of movies. I don't see a lot of movies. I'm not proud of this fact, but I'm, I am admitting it. I, mean, I love my work, uh, but I'm not a student of, of film. The train fly. Cue the fly. So I was not aware of any Treasure Sierra Madre analogies. Um, you know, my feeling is that there's only about three or five themes that exist and everything's an interpretation to some degree of any one of them. We, we did make a point that, yeah, I mean, the watch was, uh, you're supposed to be able to read it at the beginning, but it was impossible to shoot it without it being just such a big clunky, like, you know, baseball bat to the forehead and kind of, you know, to, to read that inscription at the beginning when he picks up the watch. But yeah, he's got to divest himself of all of these, all of the trappings of what his, of his father and his father's, and the, the father's story, the, the tragedy, the personal tragedy. And, and so I do think, you know, we originally had it at the end of the movie, Sean gives him the watch back and, and, you know, that was going to be, but then I like the idea that, that he, they're watching him. They're down the street, and he's gone to the American Embassy, and then somebody in here is walking by him and hears what he's doing and comes back out and says he's pawned the watch, and they're like, fine. All right, well, we'll get back, you know. But there's some other, you know, they have another plan for him if, if, he, if he can't figure it out, but he does. He's, you know, fairly, he's no dummy. He'll figure it out. And he does figure out a way to get across the border and get back. And, and I love the fact that he has to, that he has to give up the watch. That to me was, you know, you got to get rid of that stuff. That's the old. That's the stuff that ties you down. How much is a watch like that worth? Well, a couple of hundred at least. And and again, you know, we're an hour and a half later or something into the movie, so it's it's kind of tricky. It's literally like the third shot of the movie is the, his his watch. So, um, but I liked, you know. We always referred to this as the Sullivan's Travels part of the whole thing. But uh, I like the idea that, that he does it on his own. You know, that it, that it was, you know, we, like I say, we had, it, we, ha we had CRS giving him his watch back at the end. But I like the fact that, that he doesn't get it, that he's fine parting with it. Again, I look at the movie differently because I, I I'm I'm was never intending that you should buy everything. That again, he's in a movie. They're making him be in a movie that he doesn't want to be in. So it's not that you, you. I mean, you're always aware that that it's a movie, so that something has to happen that turns this all around. But that he, do I buy that that he thinks. That this is the solution that he's come up with for this predicament that he sees directly in front of him. Yeah, I mean, I I always felt that way that he that he was trying the only thing that he knows how to do after he's hitchhiked, you know, as far as he can go, and you know, he then goes, he sees a diner, and he goes in and he tries to, you know, he's got 17 bucks left, and he tries to appeal to somebody on that level, and and it's interesting that take when he walks into the Done. That was like take number two in the watch, and he dropped the money. He actually did, and and it kind of threw off the whole performance in it because he was sort of trying to find his way back into it. And and I remember thinking, and we shot like ten, eight or ten more takes after that to try and get this other thing. And Michael at the time said, you know, I think that take, second take is really it was pretty good. And we had a much more efficient kind of version of it, but we went back to that because it did have this kind of like weariness you know because he he didn't sort of he wasn't planning on dropping the money and you know i think i specifically asked him not to drop the money ever again and then I ended up using the one <laughs> we could have had so many more choices screenwriters john brancato and michael ferris john brancato there's christian imagery all the way through it i mean the white rabbit is also the easter bunny 31 
Baskin Robbins. I mean, that truck going by is a nice little moment there because it's a nice Christian three into one, tri you know, triumvirate of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost kind of stuff. Clearly, the whole story is entirely about rebirth and dying in order to be born again. Climbing out of the coffin would be the most literal. Pretty darn literal, but jumping off at the end is probably the, the most literal thing that you have to you have to die in order to start again. Jeffrey Beecroft. And Michael is such a good sport about climbing over that fence. <laughs> that fence was used about six times. We kept using the gates over again and moving them from place to place. It's too bad in this house you don't see the dining rooms and the other rooms that were all built or, or decorated for it, you know, um, but uh, they were cut out of the film. I like that kind of Newport feel even about the house, you know, the, the big house, grand houses of Newport, and there's something about that in, in this home. You know, I got one of those um, one of those book safes, you know, and they and they usually they come with sort of different titles on them that you can get, and and they're usually semi famous, and they're usually in the public domain. <laughs> I think *To Kill a Mockingbird* is in the public domain. We were looking for some title that would be memorable, you know, if you if you actually hid a three fifty seven Magnum somewhere in your in your house, you'd want to be able to recall at a moment's notice what the title of the book was so it would have to be something that people know and 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 uh it was, it was a nice one to sort of see in gold leaf on the side of that it just looked good is there a problem there was a scene in that there was a scene in one of the drafts where he goes to the hospital to see conrad and conrad is hopelessly insane and says don't leave me don't leave me and he leaves he can't deal with Conrad, and he leaves Conrad. But it just made the third act too long and made it too... It threw off the... the it threw off the, the, the detective beat, the him figuring out about the... Um, it was weird to go, to go from the... It was a little bit too much of a straight line to go from the hotel to the mental institution and then have him go f f see his ex-wife. It seemed to me like it's the kind of thing that we didn't need to sell, that, that Conrad was in a mental institution. It seemed like that would be something that they would be able to arrange and the audience would buy it at the end. And and although it was an interesting scene and it's a scene I really love the idea of, like, you know, the wink-wink, you know, because it gave Conrad this, you know, it gave Sean, actually it was deleted before Sean was even mentioned but but it gave whoever was going to play conrad this great scene to just be a f psycho just you can't leave me you can't leave me this crying like urinating like you know slob we couldn't sort of figure out what it would mean you know we couldn't sort of figure out i, I love the idea of him saying let's just just sit here and be with me and be my brother and just you know hold me and tell me everything's going to be okay because i'm so freaked out and that that would be the th last thing in the world that this guy's prepared to do or can, you know, he would just go, Ugh, don't, don't sit so close to me, you know. I'd love to do this and this sounds great and I can see why you need it, but I gotta go, you know. And, but it just was like another asshole beat and it was not quite, it didn't do anything but that. Although maybe it gives you your, your, your neener neener at the end, you know, the, the Cain and Abel neener neener. But then to see him on the rooftop at the end, you know, four scenes later, just seemed like it cheated the whole geography of it, you know. It would take half a day to get to Napa if you didn't have a car. It would take half a day to get back, and then you'd have to, then he'd have to find his, then he'd have to find Elizabeth, and then he would have to go and see the Aleve commercial or whatever, and, and that would lead him to the Chinese restaurant. And so it seemed like it, it just got unwieldy. I was happy about this relationship with my uh, my ex-wife. In a very small part of the screen time, you had a real sense that there had been a love uh, there that had existed between them. I think all the actors I work with could give good performances because I give them trust. Rather than competing, um, as a lot of actors do, that they know that all I want them to be is as good as they possibly can be. And I do that by being for them off stage, off camera, uh, on every take. So 
they know um, that I want them to be good. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because at this point my career, because of my past history with actresses, the new actresses come in and they feel relaxed and they know already. Can I borrow your yellow pages? Production designer Jeffrey Beecroft. So now you go back to Chinatown. You can see the recurring thing. He takes you back to places you've been. You've seen the back streets of Chinatown. Now you're going to see front streets of Chinatown. Everything's kind of cyclical in that way. Best Chinatown. Oh, get out of the car, fucker. Open the door and leave They the cut this out of the film, too, where basically this guy was not supposed to be part of the game. He's just a guy who tries. They go, what? You know, he says something. You know, yeah, that guy and the the guy with the uh, the guy in Chinatown really scared me. And it, and it, what guy in Chinatown? He he wasn't one of ours. Cafe. He does commercials. You know how many castles we have? Hundreds, thousands. I, I, I know he ordered from, from you. He went to Montgomery Street, ten nineteen. Yeah. Montgomery. Is there anybody here that can help me? He's a doctor. He's like one of these people. Now we built half of this set on location. Well, you're going to see Kenny Rogers. You're going to see... Uh... There's Linda Mann right there. Hey, why are you taking my picture? And you can't go wrong in San Francisco. You just put a phone booth wherever you want, and it looks great. <laughs> well, is there uh, any place we could contact you? Well, his neighbor's here on the table. He took the kids to the zoo. The zoo? That's very, very sweet. It had, we put a pagoda on top of it, and uh, you don't see it in the shots. So. This is a location that I remembered as a child, the tiger cage. I, I remembered this. I thought this was like an extraordinary place. And the scene was written to be outside. But I thought, wouldn't it be at, at looking at elephants, I think, and I, or monkeys? And I said, well, David, I found this place. I remember it. And David and I both had been here as children to the zoo. And I said, it's all tigers inside, and it feels like a stalking scene. And then Michael almost looks, and he's stalking Feingold. So we put it in here where he's now, he's now on the attack. Tammy, Alex, cut it out. Damn it, why do they do that? Offices are empty. I need to find out. This tiger cage is a scene where everything that we have set up pays off. Now Michael becomes the stalker. Uh, and that's why we have the, the tigers, we have top light coming down, we are surrounded by bars. So now he has just put Feingold in the cage, which I think makes Michael, Michael's character feel like he's in control. But I just like the idea that kind of uh, the tiger quality of Michael now. And that line is saying, I want to see what's behind the curtain, I want to take me to the wizard. And this is really what's going on. Extremely dangerous. Michael, guys, come on, we're leaving. Michael Douglas. I think the scene in the cafeteria, in the end of the picture, the the build up to that was the and this was my choice. The degree of of um, of how crazy I was and uh, that I felt that the, the problems on one side was the reincarnation of coming out of the coffin in, in Mexico, partially as a new person, but the other part was this the old-fashioned strapping on your guns, and I'm gonna get them, I'm gonna get those mothers, I'm gonna get them, which you say, gee, that's not... So you had these two things working against each other. You had one about the birth of a new man, and then, you know, coming up and, uh, you, know, you know, beginning a life again. And then the other one was that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get him. So I, I felt that, that that was the needed, that you really had to have a dementia feel of a guy on the edge of a nervous breakdown because I was also looking ahead to the roof sequence and, and all of that. And because the picture got so far out here that it seemed to me important that this guy was disturbed. Uh, and so he was just, you know, driven by this desire to get to the, the bottom of it with these... Uh, uh, these disturbed little kids, um, and the scene in the uh, in that cafeteria was 
I always thought it was great. It was really fun. I mean, it was an opportunity. Oh, my God, there's that one, and there's that one. And all the people who you were, didn't know or didn't, weren't sure whether they are part of the game or not. Director, David Fincher. The, the comms here for me was always like the Mel Brooks scene. It was like we had to have like a guy in, a, in Trojan armor and like, you know, we, we had to have everything. We had to have, you know, the, the, uh, the, the uh, what is it, the weightlifting, you know, the, the, the guy in the, the circus, you know, the, the, the strong man. We had to have like, you know, a couple of w women in, you know, uh, Vegas showgirl outfits riding elephants and stuff you know you just needed to throw everything in and interestingly enough of course as soon as it's one of those things where you just you like the idea and you go great let's let's do that and you've got you know we've got nuns and and drag queens and all this stuff and then you get to the set and you just go oh my god get all these people out of here this is just awful and um it was tough i mean i i do think that the, that scene should have been shot with like nine people in the room you know, just the ones that you knew. They were all sitting around smoking cigarettes, talking to each other. And, you know, with the idea that you're walking into school and cafeteria and everybody that you just humiliated yourself in front of is talking about you, you know. But there's something about spreading out, you know, so you have 120 people or something in there and you and it becomes so crowded. It was like it's impossible to see what was going on. It was just a bad directorial decision. It should have just been, you know, the taxi driver and you know, the two businessmen and, you know, the, the uh, private investigator and, you know, a couple of key people, Linda Mans. It shouldn't have been. It was too, too complicated to take in. When I see the final scene, I see, you know, that, you know, Deborah has dolled herself up to look like something else completely. She's no longer the, you know, motorcycle boot wearing you know, put upon waitress with an attitude at, at the city club. She's she's playing another part. She's already on to her next thing. But um, I think that the, uh, the... But I do think that the master shot of that scene got too confusing. There's just too much to take in and, and not enough payoff. Screenwriter Michael Ferris. People were very frightened about the ending and whether anyone would buy... Um, Michael Douglas finally jumping, and I think uh, an awful lot of drafts were devoted to just trying to to sell that. And finally, that's something I think, you know, the director and the actor sold beautifully, and we sort of perceived that finally it was something that was just going to either work on screen or it wasn't. I mean, there's not, there's really nothing you can put on paper to to convince people that this man wants to kill himself now. You know, you just have to look at him and believe it. It was sort of beyond our craft that moment. I'm, I'm glad it came off. Tell me, who's behind this? Well, this is one of those scenes, uh, the finale of the movie up on the roof, that when you commit to do the movie, you know you're going to have to shoot it someday. My belief on this scene was I had to make it, I had to make it work. I had to, to have a sense of reality of a man coming to pieces. And um, I knew it was going to be a, um, an emotional workout and a stamina workout, uh, and uh, it was. It was all of those, uh, all of those things. You could not second guess yourself. This is the kind of scenes where you, where you, you have to rid yourself of all things in the back of their mind that this is only a game, and that it, one minute after the scene they're going to realize it. But right now, my responsibility was to make the audience think that I shot my brother, I killed my brother. Um, and, you know, nobody could believe how the movie had taken this turn. And then to top it off, he's dead and then I'm gonna jump off the, uh, the building. It came very quickly, that transition. So that was why I felt, geez, this guy to jump off, I mean, we, we, the audience has got to buy the fact that, that this happened. I mean, there cannot be a question in their heads, so that was my, my responsibility was to try to convince everybody that I killed my brother and my life was gone. The moment that I miss from the rooftop is in our original draft, uh, before he jumps, uh, the person he shot, which actually wasn't his brother, but, but uh, the waitress in the original version, sits up, eyes wide open and, and screams, you know, you're making a mistake. And it's too late because he's already taken the step, he's already taken the fatal plunge. Um, 
we we fought well we fought as hard as we could fight being writers and all but we we really fought to uh try to preserve that moment because we thought it was very important when he's falling that he should be thinking i've made a terrible mistake i've made a terrible mistake i want to live i want to live and that way when he actually lands on the mattress and and does live it's like crs has finally given him a genuine gift instead of pulling another trick on him as it is because he falls off the building saying i fucked up my life i want can i say that I messed up my life, I want to die, I want to die. When he hits the mattress, it's like they're just playing one more mean joke on him. It's a joke with a decent payoff, and he gets the uh, more or less the same cathartic effect. It's a subtle difference, but it seemed important to us. When we wrote this scene, we were very uh, careful to try and choreograph it in a way that would seem plausible in the end. The building was designed to be no more than like eight or ten stories with a central atrium that could be entirely filled with life-saving cushions that essentially no matter where he jumped, jumping off the edge is not being an option because of the walls there, um, he would land on it. And it, clearly the version that's, uh, that was shot, although it looks spectacular and is quite gripping, is also utterly implausible. I mean, you know, that, that anybody could I mean, a professional stuntman couldn't survive a fall of that distance. Uh, the odds of his actually landing in the spot on the roof where he does are infinitesimally small, so that the movie really does become magic here. And uh, people seem to have, like, gone with it. You know, they seem to have bought it, said, well, it looks so incredibly cool that so what if it couldn't happen, you know? So what if the odds of his hitting that target were pretty slim? I mean, last-minute attempts were made to... Um, guide his footsteps, as it were, along the edge of the roof. When we tested the movie, I think we had three or four walkouts um, right at the point where he jumps off the building during the fall, and people just got up and said, fuck this movie. <laughs> I like the uh, I like the fall, and I love the sort of dreamlike quality of it. You know, you know it's real because it's set up as real, but there's something about it that's also sort of kind of better than or worse than or somehow different from what you expect really falling off a building. And yet, it's presented in a very naturalistic way. I mean, we didn't do... I think we, we did one POV looking up at his feet, which is a shot I really like. We got him. He's in the back. We have him here. He came in right on the target. Initially, we told more. Initially, there's a, you know, the beginning of the scene, there's there's a whole... Uh, the beginning of the scene where he walks in and, and he sees Jimmy Reborn and... He says, you know, uh, thank God you jumped because if you didn't, I was supposed to push you. And um, In test screenings, the audience sort of didn't need the information. They sort of, like you say, they, they, they saw the commissary scene and figured it was all under control. So really what they wanted was, or they seemed that what they wanted was the, they wanted to get it wound down. They wanted it to be done with. And so we, we cut some of that stuff. It just seemed a little bit of over-explaining after the point. I love that stuff, you know. I just think we we may have erred on the conservative side and trimmed it back too much. The whole process of, uh, of, of this movie was bringing this man back to life. Um, I mean, symbolically, that he was, he, was, he was dead. He was a walking... Wounded, he was emotionally dead. He didn't feel anything, and uh, now we brought him back. This was the most dangerous transition, actually, is after the fall, is trying to bring this picture back to a uh, to a happy ending. And it has had mixed results. Uh, I liked it. Some people found it, um, you know, unacceptable. You know, this was uh, you know we debated about this. I thought this should. I thought it was very important to have a real sense of bonding with my brother. Uh, you know, bonding and, and it, was a, it was a dangerous, dangerous move, but I felt it was the only way to kind of go do it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my brother, Nicholas Van Orden. I always was pushing that the movie ended right here on this applause, ladies and gentlemen. This was fine. I always thought it could have ended right there. So I, I thought all this, the party and explaining everybody what everybody did was not necessary. But he's a director, so... I liked the game a lot. Uh, I thought it was 
in all aspects, you know, very well made. My only concern uh, was if it had enough heart and soul. Unfortunately, the only way that most of us uh, judge a picture is on its box office success. And sometimes you don't know. Well, I think, sorry, I think marketing obviously plays a, a role uh, in how a movie is perceived. But I think the game as a concept was, was dangerous, exciting, uh, manipulative, and, you know, well executed, but I think it's a kind of picture that can make some people uncomfortable. Some people feel that they're being manipulated and, uh, and are uncomfortable with that. Others had a tough time actually following the plot, following the story. Um, I, I totally agree, and I think that there's going to be a long shelf life for the game. I think it's a, it's a great picture, certainly one that I'm very proud about in my, in my resume. Ooh, what this is all about is your taste in champagne is excellent. Ideally, we would have been able to end the movie the minute he lands on the cushion. The movie is over for all intents and purposes. Obviously, you can't really end a movie at that precise moment. So an awful lot of rewriting went into the process of the the coda, as it were. Uh, we, we, I mean, we, we wrote so many endings for this movie, and some of them were very, very Twilight Zone-like. There's a little suggestion in this version that, well, maybe it's not over. He has that kind of trippy moment when he's looking around the city streets. We had some versions where that was much more overt, where he's basically told, you know, welcome to level two. Finally, that seemed a little too mean. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, maybe, you know, it, it can be over. The whole, like, running across the street to talk to, um, you know, a waitress, you know, which is something that he is not, he's not capable of doing at the beginning of the movie. He has no interest in anybody else. He's, and at the end of the movie, he, you know, people say, well, you know, he wants to see her because she's a beautiful blonde and he wants to get her phone number or whatever. But I, I always saw it as, like, this is a guy who wants to get the license plate number of the truck that hit him. You know, it's like you got to... You know, you got to kind of see in that person's face that they're not holding it. You know, you you want to look at her and make sure that she's not holding any grudges because she's turned his life so upside down. And not be, not because of her, not because, but just she's been part of this thing that's that's really reoriented his shit. So I saw it as he co he goes a, across the street just to kind of go. Hey, um, no hard feelings. Thank you very much, I guess. This has been very strange. I don't know what to say. And she's like, oh, this is even weirder for me. I never kind of stick around for these things. And then he says, well, listen, you know, maybe sometime we could talk about it or whatever. And she says, uh, maybe, I don't know. And then she has their little slip up, which she actually did. She just fucked up a line. And I just like the idea of somebody who's been playing the game so so many years that they're not really aware of. They've told so many lies, they don't remember what the truth is. So when he asks her, where are you from? She's like, ooh, did I say that? I didn't mean to. That's that's not true. <laughs> and then the ending, she comes across with something that's very, very real and honest, which is, well, maybe you want to come to the airport and have coffee. I mean, I'll, okay, I'll, if you're interested, I'll, I'll do this. I'll make this effort. And he's like, okay, <laughs> now what? Now what do I do? I, do I get in this? Should I get in this cab? But I never looked at it as a doo-doo-doo, it's starting again. Movies are like haircuts, you know? <laughs> They seemed like a good idea then, and, and you just don't want to see a picture of it later on. You know, it's like fashion changes and things change, and, you, and, and your face changes, and, you, and the things that you want from... It isn't important anymore. You know, I have a very different opinion of how... what the life of a movie is. You know, I used to think that... I used to think that it was all about its first release. Get the film to the premiere, wash your hands of it, and then see how it does in its first kind of circle of the globe. And I honestly don't feel that anymore. I honestly feel like you you read a script and it becomes a, it becomes a film for you in your head. And then you, and, and there's no 
faces attached to it, or maybe there are, maybe you read it with actors in mind, but you're reading it with this kind of ideal. You know, you've, you're seeing this ideal. This person's able to bring X, Y, and Z to this thing, and and uh, and then you cast the movie, and you go into rehearsals, and then it becomes takes on a different life. It takes on the the reality of well, you've got to tell the story, and you have this much time, and you have to do this and this and this, and and people, you're catching somebody at a time in their life when this thing that you're counting on them bringing to it that they've brought to this other project that's similar or whatever. They don't want to explore that anymore. They're done with that. They're finished. They've sloughed that off. And so they're moving on to this other thing. And all of a sudden, and, and sometimes what they're doing, where they're going, is better than what you have in mind. So you incorporate that. But that changes the balance of this whole other thing. So rehearsals of movie changes. Then you go to shoot it. And now you're taking all of those possibilities and you're taking all of this potential and you're compressing it and, and forcing it you know, in this kind of box of time. So you're kind of, you're, you, time and reality compress this thing into the exploration of one or two of these ideas that heretofore have been sort of limitless. And, and then you cut it and it becomes a completely different movie because now you're losing things in terms of not what, where an actor can go, but what an audience will sit still for you know with regards to where an actor wants to go or where a performance wants to go how much of it is necessary and how much of it is unnecessary now there's this whole other constraint you know this narrative storytelling essential kind of um box you know gets put around it so the box has gotten smaller and smaller it's changed every time it's become this different thing then you put the music on it and it becomes a different movie it evolves into this other thing. And then you put it in front of an audience, you know, premiere audience in front of it. And these are all agents and producers and, and other actors and other film directors. And, and they all watch it. But they're watching it from this whole, you know, they got off work early to come to go see your thing. And they had to walk past all these people who took their pictures. So there's all these weird kind of tensions that go into that. So this movie has this whole other life. And then six weeks after the movie opens, it's in the, you know, dollar theaters or whatever on Beverly Boulevard and you know you go in and you see it with 15 people in the room that's a completely different it's a complete they're they're bringing a completely different thing to it they're not paying eight bucks to see it they're paying two bucks or whatever and and they're seeing it in the middle of the afternoon and they're expecting less or different or or more or something else from it than the people who saw it at the premiere or the people who saw it when they were supposed to judge it at the at the uh, at the uh, preview screenings the movie then goes to Laserdisc. Ten years later, people look at it and they haven't seen the trailers, and they're not being hyped by the by the print ads, and they're not being they're not being promised these things. And all of a sudden, they're watching the movie. They're finally, <laughs> ten years later, watching the movie the way you first read the script, which is with zero expectation and with no understanding. You know, so movies never stop having a life. Whereas I used to think I'm working towards premiere night. I'm working towards that showing. It's like now I just kind of I'm feeling more like you do what what you think's right. You're trying to to make something that's the truest expression of what it is, and then get out of the way and get back and and you know stop worrying about it and stop. I take as much responsibility as I can for my actions while I'm actually doing it, and then I try to let it go as quickly and as completely as possible. This commentary is copyrighted 1998 by the Criterion Collection.